Minute. To referendum politics now and the court referendum push is presenting a lifeline to some politicians who have been taking a backseat ever since the 2013 general election. The launch of court's hunt for a million signatures brought out some interesting guests. Is it the beginning of the electioneering period for 2017? Samogina has the details. After declaring she was taking a political leave until March 2015, former presidential aspirant and NAC Kenya party leader Martha Karua made a surprise comeback at the launch of Code's a million signature hunt. Likewise, after a political lull, Kenya National Congress presidential aspirant Peter Kenneth bounced back backing the Okowa Kenya movement drive. Despite harboring different political ideologies, God's referendum push appears to be a common uniting factor, but might it be the common denominator to resuscitate the political ambitions of the two? In Kenya, people do not coalesce around because of principles or because of ideology. It's they coalesce around politics because of opportunities and populism. So, if you're not in government, then you should be in opposition. So, if Martha Karua and Peter Kenneth are not supporting government, then they can't let an opportunity such as the Okoa movement pass them. While lobby groups might have also joined the push, but the bets are high for Karua and Kenneth, whose political lifelines had been dimmed after the general election. Pandits say it is all about positioning for the two to make a comeback in the political scene. I am here to ensure that the promise of the constitution is delivered to Kenyans. <laughs> Analyst Quip Code's launch of the Okoa Kenya movement essentially has kicked off the 2017 campaigns. And just like in 2005 and subsequent 2010 referendum, the push is likely to shape the country's direction and momentum in the lead up to the general election. While in 2005 the No team, represented by an orange, transformed itself into a formidable political alliance, and in 2010 the No side fashioned Deputy President William Ruto as Rift Valley Kingpin. Code's referendum push is likely to produce a similar strategy. If referendum in 2005 shaped Raila, in referendum in 2010 shaped uh, Ruto. And so this referendum or whatever comes out of the Okoa movement, certainly there is going to be some point of gravitation. There's somebody who is going to come out of this as a rallying point where people are actually coalescing for certain uh, leadership directions. Code is essentially creating a gravitational pull to rally those harboring reservations on the Jubilee administration on its side. The coalition eyes to drop in governors to crystallize the referendum push. Only three governors, all from Code, attended the Okoa Kenya movement launch. The fact that there are different initiatives taking place, I'm sure that as, as Kenyans, at some point, all this will be still, all this will crystallize. What we should be prepared for is who is going to be the center around which people will organize or what is going to be the issue that will, will help organize the politics of 2017 and who is likely to be championing those issues. Samogina KTN. Muranga Governor Mwangi Wairia today appeared before the Senate's Public Accounts and Investments Committee and apologized over the recent standoff. Now, the governor was one of the four governors who infuriated senators by snubbing summonses to clarify on queries raised by the Auditor General on their 2013 budget. Moranga County Governor Mwangi Wairia decided to swallow his pride after he was forced to apologize to the Senate's Finance Committee for ignoring previous summons. Mr. Governor, sir, the officers who attract allowances when they travel are usually the big people. The solution is not for the governor to appear if, if the infill within, within the two entities is still entrenched. We are appear because I've not done anything. Mwangi's appearance before the committee came just hours after the Senate wrote to Treasury asking that funds to four counties, including his own, be blocked. He insisted that his performance as far as finance management was concerned was exemplary. Don't come here as the accounting officer and also as the auditor. The auditor has put his query in writing. And we are saying you had challenges, probably that's why you spend this money. Whatever we receive is in very safe custody. Now, we want you to give us evidence to make us believe you that you paid the salaries for the 22 million shillings and that you paid allowances and statutory deductions. Most likely, 
can swear we saved we saved government money by not taking this to those projects. The Muranga governor is one among four others who are blacklisted by the Senate for failing to answer to crucial questions raised by the Auditor General's report. How did the, if we were to go now, the line chairman is you are taking, we would then have to ask how did the auditor come up to the conclusion that certain, certain amount, amount of money was used from the LATIF for payment of um, the salaries, allowances, and statutory deductions. It is in my very best interest to recover that money sooner than yesterday. However, if I strictly give myself a timeline, there are variables which will not be within my, within my direct control. It still remains to be seen whether Governors William Kabogo of Kiambu, Jack Ranguma of Kisumu, and Chair of the Governor's Council Isaac Ruto will appear before the committee to make peace with the Senators. Well, seven elderly people, among them five men and two women, are reported to have died in Logete village in Baragoy due to starvation. Nine others remain in critical condition in Samburu County, the elderly being the most affected after residents moved out of the area with their livestock in search of pasture and water, leaving behind the aged. The drought that has hit Baragoy region has caused these residents of Legate village to become nomads in search for water, food and pasture for their livestock. Seven elderly people have so far died as a result. And as many continue to move, the old remain behind, too fragile, too weak to save themselves. They can only walk to get out of their houses. The breeze outside calms them in the hot weather during the day. Nine others remain in critical condition in Samburu County as the hunger pangs continue to bite. The worst affected areas being Kawap, Ngaroni, Nachola, Swari, Seri Olepi and Marti. Residents are calling on the government to intervene and distribute relief food in the area. In the meantime, the acacia tree wild fruits is what is keeping the very young and the very old alive. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, the unfolding hunger situation was predicted to peak around August. Those knowing the reality of that report being the elderly at Baragoy. Masi Kandia Katie and Prime. All right, let's do a situation analysis on that particular story by Masi Kandia in studio. I have with me the Principal Secretary, uh, Ministry of Devolution and Planning, John Conchella. Thank you so much for joining us on KTN. Thank you, Linda. All right, before we get into this, let's look at something that happened at the beginning of the year uh, when um, we had stories of drought and famine, of course, that was ravaging some parts of the country. Let's listen in. Yeah. Samburu East, some county, hiyo area hakuna manana ya hata uh, 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 marisho ni shida. I think you've seen me in various parts of the country um, addressing myself to this issue, launching irrigation programs, trying to revive ones that have collapsed, all with the aim of ensuring that this, what you call a national embarrassment, which it is, is actually resolved once and for all. Bona Pierce, yes. from the minute the president said we need to sort this once and for all, yeah. was there a plan in place? Yes, Linda. Uh, you know, okay, the situation of drought uh, can never be probably be a situation which can be entirely predicted. Mm. The action we have taken as a government, we were aware that uh, there is a problem of uh, food shortage in the country, uh, particularly in the sal areas. We have carried the necessary assessment and we've been managing to reach uh, the needy on the ground. But the first line of support normally comes from the county governments. Mm -hmm. Uh, our part is normally uh, to immediately get there and distribute the food to the county headquarters where the food will be distributed by the county governments, uh, governors from the county headquarters to the needy people on the ground because they are the one better place to understand the situation in their respective counties. And this was uh, a culmination of an agreement which was uh, entered between uh, His Excellency the President and governors from Masal counties that we agree that as a national government will avail food 
up to the county headquarters, distribution of food, provision of water and medicine remain a function to be performed by uh, county government. So basically you've played your part. We've done our part. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the situation of Samburu, I was there over the weekend personally, and His Excellency the British President was also there following the... Ago, yeah, yes. they about, uh, on, we were there on Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. And we managed to get to the ground to understand the situation. It is of course needy. We managed to supply the food which was required to virtually each and every constituency for the necessary distribution. Okay, so what is the situation like on the ground from what you saw and what you're getting from your people on the ground? Yeah, the situation is needy, no doubt. And uh, that's why the government speedily moved to a fail one billion shillings mm -hmm. uh, towards uh, averting this kind of situation. One billion shillings? One billion shillings, okay. yeah. So Specifically this is, for Samburu or? No, for the whole country, okay. for the, whole, the entire Sal uh, counties which are affected by hunger. Mm -hmm. So we have the money. And uh, you, as you know, we've been having about feeding about 1.3 million Kenyans who are in the Asal counties. The figure has now slightly increased to 1.5. We are, of course, as a government, aware that we need a long term and sustainable solution to this kind of situation. And that's why uh, uh, we have come up with uh, what we call uh, the. <coughs> Uh, we call it what? Okay, uh, before we get there, yes. are we now yeah. at a point as a country yeah. where we can declare that we have famine and drought in certain areas? And if indeed we are at that point, mm. what areas are raising the red flag? Yes, uh, Samburu is one, Baringo is the other one, and then Wajia, uh, Marsabit, uh, Isiolo, uh, uh, Mandera. The entire northern, uh, northern and northern, northern Kenya is affected by drought as we speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, the long-term plans, of course, are there, but uh, you realize the government has been in power for the last one year. We can't really change what has been the situation. But in terms of plans to change the situation, uh, we have the ending drought emergency strategy, which is a 10-year plan, which has been uh, uh, aligned to the MTP2. Mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, Kenyans become food uh, uh, sufficient mm -hmm. in their respective uh, locations. And this is why the government is taking up things like irrigations mm -hmm. very seriously. You saw the Minister of Agriculture was in Arok the other day, uh, kind of introducing irrigation. You see what, is, what we are doing in Bura. These are some of the things we have initiated that the government is taking or undertaking to ensure that in the long run, mm -hmm. Kenyans should be food sufficient in their respective uh, areas. Okay, I know you've said that you've done your part yes. and a lot of uh, what needs to be done needs to be done by the county government. But putting in mind that people are dying and probably more could die if nothing or very little is done, what are you doing as a ministry to help? And if you're doing anything to help, at what point do the residents, can the residents expect help? Uh, Linda, I can tell you, we were in Samburu on Friday. Mm. As soon as we heard that there is a problem, we immediately took action by being on the ground ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have also our staff who are carrying out uh, the necessary assessments on the ground on the situation of need in liaison, of course, with the county government. Mm -hmm. And we hope to come up with a f common front of making sure that we combat this kind of situation. It's a situation, of course, which is uh, complicated because it's affecting an entire region of Northern Kenya, which has uh, a number of challenges. One, infrastructure is a big challenge. Mm. Uh, so we have to liaise us with the county government and other stakeholders uh, like the donor communities to ensure that we reach to all the areas affected by drought. Okay, so fine. You're trying to reach all the areas affected by drought. Yes. Um, if we go back to that uh, 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 bite by the president at the beginning of this interview, he said this is a national embarrassment. And indeed, we have had this year in, year out. To Kenyans, it's a perennial problem. Yes. What long-term measures are we putting in place to ensure that 2015, we will not be having people dying and sending off relief food, just like we've done uh, over the, uh, the last couple of years? I want to say, Linda, that this is not a matter that we can just wake up one day and end it. That's why that I'm asking way. for yes. the long term. We plan. have a long term plan. The ending drought emergency strategy mm. is a, a 10 year uh, strategic plan of uh, the government of Kenya to address critically uh, how we can come out of this mess in a, a kind of systematic manner. Mm. It may not be achieved immediately, but we, have, we are sure within the time frame of the strategic plan, we should be able to come out with a solution to this problem. What is involved in this plan? A one is uh, initiatives of uh, 
food sufficiency at the local level. Because you realize, Linda, even if we have food in one side of the country, mm. and there is another corner of the country which does not have food and they don't have money to buy, we must buy food to feed this one. Otherwise, it will be difficult to sustain that kind of thing. What we are trying to do is now to come up with irrigation projects in each and every county to ensure where we can do irrigation, let us get the food there among those people to come out with that kind of uh, mess which is ravaging this country and which is expressed by his excellency is a, mm. a natural it's a yeah yeah all right um finally before i let you go give kenyans an assurance that even with this what we are seeing right now in samburu and and baragoy yeah. we're sorting this out i want to assure kenyans that the kenyan government has taken a step to ensure that no kenyan die of hunger and we, I appeal to county government to be the first line of uh, really response to assist us in identifying areas of need for us to ensure that we reach as soon as practically possible. The resources are available now. One billion was released uh, uh, the, the, uh, three weeks, I mean three days ago, and we are now going moving fast to secure the necessary relief food, and thereafter we'll make sure that we try our level best to reach each and every uh, corner of the country which is affected. Okay. But of course, the responsibility of identifying is rested on the county governments, okay. which are on the ground. Principal Secretary, Ministry of Devolution and Planning, John Conchella, thank you so much thank for you very speaking much, to KTN yes, Crime. Let's you. look at another issue that is raising concern among Kenyans. And the government has come under sharp criticism over its prevention measures against Ebola. The Kenya Medical Association has termed Ebola screening at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport as casual, while the Parliamentary Caucus on Human Rights accused Kenya Airways of prioritizing profits rather than halting flights to West African countries. All these came as KQ announced it will maintain its flight to the troubled region. Ian Wafula has the details. With the country being categorized by the World Health Organization as a high-risk infection area for the Ebola virus, the government has come under sharp criticism over its preparedness on prevention measures. Both the Kenya Medical Association and Parliamentary Caucus on Human Rights, reading from the same script, pointing fingers at the national carrier for failing to halt flights to West Africa. Kenya receives more than 76 flights from the West African countries affected by the Ebola virus weekly, with three airlines largely capitalizing on the market. Among them are the national carrier Kenya Airways, Rwanda Air and the Ethiopian Airlines. We sincerely hope that even as they do this, they have clear risk mitigating factors to reduce the risk of transmission of disease in this, to this country. Because short of that, we don't understand the motive that is still driving them to continue doing those flights. We are facing major international public health crisis for which Kenya businesses, government agencies, and private citizens must be fully prepared to so that we can prevent loss of life. The Parliamentary Health Committee on its part stated that it will summon Health Cabinet Secretary James Masharia to elaborate further on the ministry's plan to ensure Ebola does not get into Kenya. Kenyans, we have, we have used to do things once they happen. This time round, we, we joke with Ebola, we'll pay it painfully. Even as the Kenya Airways refuted claims that their decision was influenced by profits, they maintained that they will still have flights to the West African countries. We are not doing whatever we are doing because of following money. We are doing what we are doing because it's our duty, it's our work. They're sending two doctors, one to Monrovia and one to uh, Freetown, to satisfy ourselves that the pre-boarding checks that are going on are actually serious. Meanwhile, the Korean airline says it will suspend all its flights to and from Kenya from the 20th of August for what it claims is a prevention measure due to the risks of the Ebola virus. Ian Wafula, KTN. You're watching KTN Prime and we've just had an interesting discussion with the Principal Secretary, Ministry of Devolution and Planning on the reports that you're getting from Samburu, that people have died uh, because of famine and drought in that region. So on our big question tonight, we are asking you, should the county government take the blame for hunger-related deaths this time round? Tell us what you think. SMS your yes or no opinion to the number 2215 and engage us on that discussion on Twitter.
the handles are at ben underscore kitili at linda ogutu and at kate in kenya now back to this developing story even as the country grapples the questions of the ebola preparedness health practitioners dropped another bombshell today warning the government they would go on strike from monday next week representatives of various health associations called for a major nationwide strike over what they claimed was a crisis in the management of health services by the county governments. Take a look. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. The union anthem yet again. This time it is the health professionals. There are doctors within this country who have not been paid since June. Enough is enough. If health workers are not paid, the doctors already will be leaving their stations. But by Monday, other health workers are coming on board and we are going to have complete disruption of services. In one accord, health professionals from various associations aired their grievances. The professionals claim the county government is failing to handle the human resource component of the health sector. That is just one issue. If we continue to see the issue of tribalism where Bungoma dismisses the medical superintendent because he is not from that, that county, where we have MCAs in Kajiado, attacking health workers yesterday, just yesterday. Other than the delayed salaries, the union officials also claim that there is massive interference and intimidation from the county government over health matters. The supply of drugs to county health facilities is also inadequate. Asking them to sit down with our union to have a working agreement. They have never responded up to now. These guys are just after money. This is not the first time health professionals will be going on strike in the country over devolution. In December last year, a nationwide strike paralyzed the health sector. Many ordinary Kenyans who could not afford private health care were the worst hit. We need a health services commission to rescue the devolution of health care. This is the correct way to go. All these problems you are facing with health workers, between health workers and the counties are human resource issues. Kenya is sick. The health care system has collapsed. And that's why we are saying... Okoa, Afia, Movement, Imeanza, na Hatudi Nyuma. Dorka Swangira, KTN. Let's look at business news now. We begin with the aviation industry and direct flights between Kenya and the U.S. could begin as early as next year as the government uses allies to lobby the U.S. government to grant access. Following the U.S. Africa summit, Transport CS Michael Kamau says the government has received support from three U.S. firms to lobby for regulatory clearance from American aviation authorities. This could be a major boost for the country with the process having taken close to a decade. Charles Gitonga has the details of this story. The U.S.-Africa summit held in Washington, D.C. last week came with a basket full of goodies for the 40 head of states and business leaders who were in attendance. For the Kenyan delegation, establishing fruitful partnerships for the aviation industry was an agenda they could not afford to miss. Kenya's dream to have direct flights to the U.S. could soon come to life after Delta Airlines, Boeing and General Electric agreed to lobby for regulatory approval, adding fresh impetus to the government efforts over the years. If the president of Boeing and the president of Delta and General Electric are working with us, I think it makes it much more easier for us. According to the CS, the Kenyan delegation had productive talks with the U.S. Federal Aviation Authority and Transport Safety Authority about upgrading Jomo Kenyatta International Airport to FAA's Category 1 status. This is required of all airports before they can have direct flights into the U.S. As a result, an evaluation of JKIA will kick off in October and upon conclusion will open doors for direct flights by early next year. We are looking forward and hoping that uh, by early next year we should have a direct flight uh, in the U.S. either by Kenya Airways or by Delta or any other airline. America's Transport Safety Authority has been working with the Kenyan government towards improvement of security at East Africa's largest airport. These are seen the government invest 1.3 billion shillings towards acquiring high-tech security systems for their facility. Over the years, security concerns have seen airlines deny the opportunity to invest in this potential growth market. The achievement of Category 1 status of JKIA is therefore the much-awaited development that will also boost trade and tourism. Charles Gitonga, KTN Business. 
the Energy Regulatory Commission has announced a reduction of diesel and kerosene prices for the next one month. Diesel will now retail a shilling and 69 cents lower than last month, uh, while kerosene will be a shilling and 7 cents cheaper. The decrease will come as a major relief as the two fuels are the most widely used in the country. However, motorists will have to fork out more at the pump, with the regulator announcing a 76 cents increase. That will see residents in the capital city pay a maximum of 116 shillings and 62 cents. Petrol prices have been steadily rising since mid last year when it retailed at 108 shillings. The government started a monthly review of retail fuel prices in 2010 after they shot upwards, driving up the cost of living. Now, women make up almost 70% of the workforce and contribute significantly to the development of the economy. Yet despite this, they have remained at the very fringes of the corporate world with only a handful holding a significant leadership position. And now the Nairobi Securities Exchange in partnership with the Barclays Bank has rolled out an initiative that seeks to change the state of affairs and increase the level of diversity in both boards and management. Adelaide Changole has the details. The average workplace in Kenya is a ripe mix of people of different ages, genders, and ethnic groups. But this diversity thins out as one goes up the hierarchy, with women particularly bearing the brunt as they're left out of top leadership in both listed and public firms in the country. Women are outnumbered at all levels and increasingly outnumbers as they rise through the ranks. And this has replicated itself in the corporate boardrooms where women only occupy 12% of directorships in listed farms, while 23 different farms don't have a single woman on their boards. The boards of the listed companies have very few ladies who are chairperson. The number is actually insignificant. But even worse, because of affirmative action demands that disenfranchised individuals get access to opportunities that were previously denied to them, the few women who make it through the doors are considered less qualified than their male counterparts because they were supposedly held to a lower standard. Touching the special grouping tag, we take away from their qualifications because we tend to view their appointments from a narrow prism of gender, age, or special needs. And now the Nairobi Securities Exchange has rolled out an initiative that seeks to open up dialogue on the topic as they seek to entrench good corporate governance. Boards which have more women representation do better. The forums to be held in the course of this and next year will be structured as round tables targeting chairpersons, chief executives, company secretaries, and senior directors in listed firms. Adelaide Changole, KTN Business. And that's business news. And well, you're right, and you're welcome to KTN Sports tonight. I'm Lynn Washaway. We have some very good news coming in from Morocco, where the newly crowned Commonwealth uh, Games champion Unisum has led a Kenyan clean sweep in the 800 meters race at the ongoing Africa Athletics Championships in Marrakesh, Morocco. Early in the evening, Calvin Katanta won a bronze medal in the 200 meters race, while Francisca Koki also bagged a bronze for Kenya in the 400 meters hurdles final. Meanwhile, Commonwealth Games 10,000 meters gold medalist. Joyce Chep Kirui extended her winning ways to the Africa Championships when she led compatriot Emily Chabet to a 1 2 finish in the women's 10,000 meters last evening. And while staying in Kigali, Gormahia will try their luck tomorrow when they play APR of Rwanda in their third group match at the Sekafa Club Championships. Kogala lost their opening two matches, but in the eyes of the midfield maestro Collins Gattuso Koth, who made a return to the club, Kogala will bounce back in Kigali, then work on retaining the KPL title. 
Colin Sokot could easily be one of the best midfielders in the country with the mold of the legendary Manchester United player Paul Scholes.